Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 141, featuring the final part of my interview with Mr. David Fox of Lucasfilm Games. In this part of the interview, we talk about his Mirage project, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, the second cataclysm, and then all what he's been up to lately with his wife, Annie. A lot of uh, great stuff for the iOS and iPad platforms and much, much more. So, got a lot of great stuff. So without further ado, here is Mr. David Fox. I wanted to uh, mention Cadillacs and dinosaurs. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, oh no! Is there's sensing a story here? What? Uh, what about Cadillacs and dinosaurs? Oh, that's kind of like your. It's in 1992. I, I actually spent two years. The last two years, I was <laughs> at Lucasfilm. I worked on a really cool um, location-based entertainment project called Mirage, which was a closest thing to my original dream, which was uh, uh, intended as a theme park experience um it was really a star wars simulator with two people inside and a wrap around uh, 120 degree field of view um window looking onto this 3d landscape and multiplayer multiple pods connected together we came up with a you know essentially it was um rescue on fractalus on steroids because it was you're flying through a mountainous terrain and um, they're, you're an X-wing or a TIE fighter. The TIE fighters and X-wings fighting against each other, and you had a, the the view was uh, the, the out the window was a collimating. We use a collimating mirror, which meant that the projectors were on the top, bouncing off of the mirror, which made it look like you were focusing at infinity. So rather than having a screen like two feet, three feet away from you, it looked like you were looking, you know, hundreds of feet away. So it made it feel like a vast landscape you're flying through. And that was a blast. And it turned out though that to actually implement those, you know, in theme parks would have been more expensive than the market would bear. I think it would have been, you know, a million dollars per pod or, or something, or way, way too expensive at, at the time. Now you could do it for way, way less with current technology. Even 10 years ago, you could have done it for way less with off the shelf. But then we were using, you know, professional evidence in Sutherland image generators used in flight simulators. And it was just, you know, really heavily engineered. So when, when that project closed down in 92, um, I didn't want to go back and just start doing Plano games again. So I ended up going freelance for a few years and figure I could just get enough um, projects and doing virtual virtual reality stuff. And um, I think after a couple of years of that, you know, I was, I had enough <laughs> of that at the time and heard about this new company, Rocket Science Games, that was starting up. And that my friend Brian Moriarty was one of the early guys that was hired. And so I called him up and said, hey, I'd like to see if I could join. And uh, it looked great on paper. Um, they had some really strong people in the group, you know, am amazing engineers, the guys who, you know, one of the guys who invented some of the best Codex, you know, compressor, decompressor software at the time, and some amazing ILM matte painters and artists, and modelers, and, and just a you know officer team. But what we ended up producing was really heavily art driven instead of game driven, and there really weren't any people in the company that were gamers other than Brian and myself originally as game designers. So. Whenever there were trade-offs, they always went to um, towards better-looking art. And the, my original game that I designed was, I mean, first of all, I was working in a genre that wasn't my type. It was basically a you know action, you know shooter shooting shoot 'em up game, uh, point of view, um, but with pre-rendered video that we had to use, as opposed to like Rescue, where you know where it's rendered on the fly. Um, so the idea was you could take these new CD-ROMs that were out there and put a bunch of video on there and have it streamed off and change, you know, like track-driven stuff where you're moving through and you get to a juncture, you could say, I want to go left or right, and the screen, the, there'd be a transition scene and you move to the next one. Back in the year 2020 AD, the Earth faced the devastation of the first great cataclysm. Earthquakes, torrential rains, tidal waves, and the melting of the polar caps signaled the unprecedented. 
unprecedented fall of an era. Billions died, and entire species were consumed. The few surviving humans huddled beneath the surface in steel tombs and waited. They got that all to work, but it it took so long to do all the scenes, to do all the CG stuff, to, to pre-render at the time, that I ended up taking what was an 11 or 12 level game, with each level being a different gameplay, and having to convert it to uh, 10 or 11 levels of the same game with um, slight tweaks and is hugely, huge compromises from the original design. Um, so I, I like the story that we came up with, but the game itself was just kind of like, uh, this is not not one of my favorite games. Yes, you mentioned a CD-ROM. I was uh, surprised. I, I ran across an interview that you had done earlier, and you said that you were really impressed with the game Myst uh, when it came out. And it's funny because a lot of the other adventure game designers I've talked to really just despised uh, Myst. <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, why mm -hmm. did uh, why did you like it? Well, the part I liked was was the being feeling like I was inside of an environment. Um, you know, if you go back to what I was trying to do was the idea of like being transported into a new world. Um, all the games, like, you know, what I wanted to do is like in, in the location based entertainment stuff too, you, that you're being inserted into someone else's new universe and being able to explore it. And I thought Mist was one of the first ones that gave me photorealistic environments that were, you know, really, you know, imaginative. There's some, some really fun puzzles, some that, which I thought weren't so fun. The thing I, I disliked about the game was that you were, you were always, um, you were you were in a wasteland if nobody was there, so you're there by yourself. It's very lonely. You know, you really weren't really interacting with anyone else. Um, but within the story, that worked. I mean, it was it kind of matched with the tone they were going for. Um, but the, you know, compared to the games we did, where there was all character driven, you know, lots of character interactions, uh, that was you know a big difference. But I thought it, I thought they did a really good job of breaking new territory, breaking new ground, and and. Um, art, the art design I thought was really, really well done. Um, you know, I always loved CG stuff at the time, so I thought they did a great job with that. So yes, that was why. So 1992, you founded or co-founded uh, with with your wife Electric Eggplant. All right, so you can tell me a little bit yes. about what Electric Eggplant is all about. Um, well, fun name. It was. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. We, we were looking for something which had a similar feel to Industrial Light and Magic that took several um, uh, concepts that, were, that weren't that were really connected and kind of squeezed them together, so electric eggplant. And the idea was, you know, was to do um, uh, multimedia, um, games, whatever we ended up doing. And we ended up both working on projects over the years. Um, sometimes it was me, sometimes it was Annie, sometimes it was both of us. Um, more recently, we did some some pretty fun Disney stuff um, for a theme park. Um, actually, when it actually got implemented, which so my, my dream of finally doing a theme park attraction actually happened. Um, and we, um, yeah, we, most recently, we've been doing apps. And I decided to start working on apps about a uh, year and a half ago and first step was to work with some of Annie's books that she wrote already for middle school kids and take the you know partnership with her publisher take the art from three of her graphic novel books where they were partly graphic novel partly self-help for middle school kids and take the graphic novel port part and turn it into into iPad apps um, but that gave me the exposure to coding. I also, I got to do the coding myself. Um, learned, uh, been using the Corona SDK for that, which, you know, I listened to one of your, a couple of your, your podcasts. And I suggest you check that out because it might be a solution for you to actually um, get some of your game ideas implemented and with maybe less, you know, frustration. Um, uh, but I, I, I love the environment. It, it opened up iOS development in a way that I probably couldn't have gotten through to having to learn Objective-C with my background. 
um, and uh, having a blast. And, and, you know, that would be the stepping stone to doing this Rube Goldberg project. So uh, I'm enjoying doing that now. Yeah, I, I, I'm a real publisher. <laughs> Finally, on the I iOS. I noticed you've uh, lately, or I guess not so lately, a few uh, cycles ago, we're doing some uh, political stuff and some uh, news, mm. uh, you know, stuff with the news, journalism, and, and things of that sort. I was wondering if you had any plans to try to uh, make some sort of games based on uh, politics or uh, stuff going on in the news. Um, probably not. The the um, the news trust project that I worked on for like six or seven years. I think we started it right after the uh, 2004 election. And it was mostly out of frustration um, of how that election went and how um, we felt that the, the news media, the media was basically acting as an echo chamber, taking information that was uh, inaccurate and spreading it without checking. So we wanted to find a way to let people actually rate the news and evaluate it and gave them tools to do it. Um, so that was kind of a, that was a, a really interesting project, kind of very divergent from what I had been doing because it wasn't entertainment at all. And I, ironically, Fabrice Florin, who I did the project with, who was the, the director of that, also had a gaming background. I mean, we, we've known each other since the late seventies. He actually was, uh, had a company doing video stuff and he interviewed us at the computer center back in 1978. So I had known him for a long time. Um, but neither of us were using a lot of gaming related components in what we did here. Uh, Fabrice is now working at Wikipedia um, or Wikimedia um, doing a bunch of stuff to, to, you know, looking at surveys and things to advance the uh, participation there. So that's kind of a cool project. Um, so the, the one thing that I got from doing, one of the things I got from doing news for us though was I ended up doing a lot of coding and it was really the first coding I had done since doing games, you know, back in the eighties. Um, so even though it's a new language and a lot of new experiences, I kind of said, hey, I guess I could still do this. So that, that was the stepping stone for me to try tackling iOS stuff. And for that, it was really fun. You know, I actually still like to code. You know, I like the puzzle part of it, you know, figuring out how something works and making it happen. Although with this new game, I'm not sure I'm going to be doing much coding. I, I, I'm not great at it, so I'd rather get other people who are, who are brilliant at coding to do that part of it. All right, David. Well, you know, thank you very, very much. It's been a, a real pleasure chatting with you. As do you want to uh, add anything that we haven't uh, talked about? Or is there anything that you'd like to plug or mention? Uh, um, well, yes, you could go to electriceggplant.com. Um, um, that's our website. And from there, you'll see links to our, um, our apps, which are at middleschoolconfidential.com. Um, also, we have an iBook that we did out of one of Annie's uh, children's stories, uh, RaymondandSheila.com, and uh, other others are in the works. And um, hopefully, when we can talk again, when we have some more Rube news to, to talk about, um, you know, maybe in six months or something, maybe you could uh, introduce the game. Oh, that'd be awesome! On your show. <laughs> it'd be an honor too. Yeah, it'd be fun. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I have some good news and some bad news. Uh, first, the bad news is I uh, won't be here next week. I'll be traveling to St. Louis, Missouri to speak at an academic conference there uh, about composi college composition. I probably won't interest you, but uh, there you have it. If you do happen to be at the conference, uh, it's called uh, Four C's. You know, happy to see you. Otherwise, I'll see you in two weeks. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is really, really good news. And that is that Brian Fargo is making Wasteland 2. He's, he set up a Kickstarter project and with just two days had raised over a million dollars. So this will be a reality. He's uh, putting together a great team. Now, if you head over there now, you can pledge, I think it's uh, $15 last time I checked to 
uh, sign up for a DRM free digital download and then from there you if you pay more money you get more and more perks and bonuses and all kinds of cool stuff so congratulations to uh, Brian really fantastic and I'm really really looking forward to seeing Wasteland 2 uh, just you know how could life couldn't be much better right now for a classic CRPG nut like yours truly now what about that ale of the week I have something here uh, that is very very special this is a an 8-bit pale ale it is a vintage gaming themed ale <laughs> I mean isn't that perfect uh, for the show I don't know how I can get much more appropriate uh, this is brewed in Manhattan Kansas so I guess somebody there in Manhattan Kansas must be a vintage games fan who knows maybe they even watch the show I'm thinking about contacting these guys to see if they'd be interested in some type of sponsorship uh, but anyway the can is I don't know if you can see this but the can is decorated with a really cool 8-bit theme uh, it's apparently made with galaxy hops it's a full pint uh, the only thing is uh, uh, the alcohol content is only 5.2 percent uh, you think of Bud Light Budweiser's probably got about 4.2 so a little bit higher but uh, I don't know maybe they were thinking if they made this too strong that uh, people wouldn't be able to play the, <laughs> the games <laughs> uh, so maybe that was actually a smart decision on their part but anyway uh, let's open it up and fill up my rather excellent drinking horn and see if uh, see if it lives up to the hype all right so I poured this way too quickly and I had to wait it felt like about 10 minutes for this foam to come to <laughs> you know fall from here to down to there so my first piece of advice guys is don't pour this too quickly or at least make sure you have a really big drinking horn if you're in sort of a hurry to drink uh, you probably want to go for something else or you know pour it just the right angle to keep that from happening but anyway it's died down now so let's give it a sniff the old sniff test this is probably the only advantage of having a big nose like mine you can really smell a lot more uh, than most people unfortunately you know even with this nose I'm not really detecting uh, much aroma from this a little bit of a you know I just don't really smell anything uh, I guess a little bit of that a little bit of a nuttiness or, or nutty flavor uh, if you could imagine a you know a can of unsalted cashews for example if you were to smell that come kind of from a distance you know you get a little whiff uh, not much you know definitely not a, a really strong smell at all but let's give it a taste a little bitterness uh, not unpleasant um, not a you know again not a very strong flavor either so uh, not much in the way of uh, all factory delights uh, the taste is a little more pronounced you do get that bitter sort of nutty flavor that's uh, pretty uh, you know typical for a pale ale <laughs> I guess that's why they call it a pale ale you know no alcohol uh, taste at all <clears throat> very smooth maybe a little bit too weak you know for my taste maybe I've just kind of gotten used to those really potent brews that I've been having on Matt Chat but uh, you know this is uh, probably actually more appropriate uh, for the theme which if, if you know you're together with a bunch of guys and you're playing vintage games having a vintage games night you know that sounds like fun you know something like this 8-bit ale is probably a good choice because you won't be you know you could drink several pints of this and be fine and still able to play that <laughs> <laughs> extra round of Zaxxon or Street Fighter 2 whatever you guys are playing so this week's quotation comes from Mr. Walt Disney a man whose influence is felt throughout the gaming as well as the movie industry especially animated films and it goes something like this Disneyland is a work of love we didn't go into Disneyland thinking just about money good old Walt Disney See you guys next week. However, I'm a busy man and I can't be bothered to punch you at the moment. <laughs> Here's my fist. Kindly run towards it as fast as you can. <laughs>